Funding for Coastal Kingdom is provided by the ETV Endowment of South Carolina, which proudly supports this program. Through the generosity of our members and donors, the ETV Endowment has funded educational and entertaining programming like Coastal Kingdom for more than 40 years. This is the Cumby River, and this is one of the three Blackwater Rivers that make up the Ace, the Ashapoo, the Cumby, and the Edisto. And these three rivers make up one of the most incredible ecosystems, 1.6 million acres of some of the least developed land on the entire Atlantic coast. Today we're going to visit the Ace Basin, a region that the Nature Conservancy once called one of the last great places on Earth. So look at that little guy. Okay, we got something big on. There we go. We've got the bird in. There's already a chick in there. This is Heather Krause, and she's the Outreach and Education Program Coordinator for Nemours Wildlife Foundation. And we get to get out and catch some birds with her today. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about your research and what you're up to. Okay, so we have a banding station at Nemours Wildlife Foundation that we operate in the summer months as part of the Monitoring Avian Productivity and Survivorship, MAPS for short. And so this program is part of a nationwide effort that is looking at breeding birds and the trends of the number of adults that are in a specific area, the uh, number of young that are produced, and how many adults come back year after year to the same location. And we're, you're here in the Moors and we're in the Ace, but this has broader implications, It right? does, yeah. So it helps us know what's in our backyard, but then that also impacts what is happening in South Carolina. And that's yeah. the thing about birds, right? Since they're migratory species, you can get bigger and bigger and bigger. Yes, exactly. I, I'll tell you what I'm most excited about is I, I, I would like to catch some birds. So I, would I, that's and what so, I always hope for. And so one of the ways to do it is is with one of these mist nets, right? And I've had a little bit of experience with this, but not much. So can you show us a little bit about how these work? Yeah, so we use what are called mist nets to you, catch these I mean, birds. Came. So yeah, you can't see it. It's, it's this very thin, mesh net so when a bird is coming through the like from an open area to the forest and they're flying at top speed they're not going to see this thin black net and they'll come into it and then they kind of land and hit this net and it's a little hammock here and so when they fly into it they just lay down in this hammock and then we check the nets every half an hour or and so you're and you're talking about songbirds mostly right i mean some of the bigger species would destroy the nets, I guess, but also songbirds are what you're, you're most interested yeah, in. Yeah, so right? what we're studying is mostly songbirds. So a lot of those backyard birds, your cardinals, your Carolina wrens, your chickadees, titmice, that's a lot of what we catch in these nets. And you know what I think it's so interesting is birds like that, you know, they're common and we see them, but they're really good indicators of what's going on. They are, they're what's called bioindicators. So you can tell what's happening across the habitat based on the birds that you see and hear. Well, I don't know about you, I, <laughs> I know you are, but I'm ready to catch some birds. So I am too. So how are we gonna do this? We're just gonna kind of walk along yeah, the nets so and look? Yeah, so we're gonna check all of these nets and make sure that there's no birds in there. And when there is, we'll take one out and then bring it back so we can get all of the information we need from them. Heather, we got, looks like we, there's some, and then, we ah, got look at this. One to at least there's four. There's four, I think there's, yeah. I'm sorry, I probably shouldn't be talking so loud. I'm gonna pull this down, because I need to get up, get the one up that's at the top. I recognize uh, the first one. So what is this first one? That is one? a ruby crown kinglet. It is. Awesome, I got a bird right. I'm so excited. And I'm it, more of a snake And it is crab just guy. in there on its, with its one wing, it looks like. So you you really do have, this is a kind of a delicate process. It, it is. So you have to get, in order to ban birds, you have to go through a permitting process. So I have a permit that allows me to put up these mist nets and put bans on um, songbirds. And also putting up nets like this comes with tremendous responsibility because you could do, if, especially if somebody left one up, 
These yeah, so that's why we have, damage. That's why we have to check them every half an hour because if you don't do that, then these birds are going to get stressed and you don't want that. You want to do as minimal amount of harm as possible. They look like they're all doing really well though. Do you know what this one is? It's got a white um, eye. So she kind of gave, that was a dead giveaway. It's obviously a white Iberia. <laughs> Thanks, Heather. You're welcome. Thanks for putting me on the spot and then bailing me out. I appreciate it. So we got, just from one net, four birds. So That's we'll awesome. take these back and we'll, we'll check the rest of them yeah, and we'll we take them back the and process. Yeah, we got to check the first. What do you see, Heather? I see a tuft of titmouth. Awesome. And that's a beautiful, beautiful little bird. We caught some birds, so we gotta go process them and okay, so pour what, all the information we need are, from them. What do you want me to do? I'll come over on this side. Okay, I'm gonna hang these birds up here that we're not gonna do right away. And then if you want to be my data recorder, that would be great, actually. Okay. Got that. Yeah, nice. so this is this is one of those things that you never really see that ruby crown unless you on the wing, so to speak, right? It's yeah. only when you catch them that you can really see that. Well, sometimes you'll see them if they're angry or something, they'll flare it out. Um, and when they're trying to attract a female, they will also really puff out that red crest. But generally speaking, yeah, you don't see that until they're in the hand and then it's got that nice red. all the information we need on it and there it is it's flying great that's what we want to see so this is what a white-eyed vireo it's one of our resident birds it's got that nice bright white eye on it that you see and like all the vireos it's kind of got this little tiny hook at the end of its beak yeah it looks like a snappier bill than, yeah it is it's a little <laughs> bit snappier TVs. and the and the eye is really something really pronounced it's you very it up close like that. very pronounced and the generally the adults are going to have that white that nice bright white and the young birds are going to have a little bit more duller gray or almost like brownish is color. this an insect eater it does. It, it eats a lot of insects, so it's going to be picking insects off of leaves and stuff and through bark, and you'll see it hovering around up in the, the leaves of trees. A tufted titmouse. And what's unique about this one is it's a recapture. So this has been put on... I bet occasionally they get out of your hand, don't they? They definitely do, yep. The wrens are notorious escape, escape <laughs> artists. Boy, the but, tuft is really evident, isn't it? Yeah, and so, you know, that's... that's a handsome little bird. Yeah, just either he's, he or she is raising and lowering it. So that was quick. That was quick. <laughs> So, Heather, I really appreciate you letting us tag along today. This was, this was amazing. And mostly I appreciate the research you're doing on these birds. Well, I'm glad to have you and show you what kind of research we're doing at Nemours and how that impacts the ace and then all that information that then feeds into a broader understanding of birds across North America. And I'll tell you what, I hope you get to see that top to tip mouse again. I do too, you know, I like seeing the recapture birds. We're here at a magnificent wetland. In fact, this is a former upland rice field. And obviously no rice is being grown here now and hasn't been for a long time, but that doesn't mean it's not incredible habitat for all kinds of birds, prothonotary warblers, uh, wood storks, wood ducks, of course. But what I'm most excited about is some of the aquatic stuff. Now we set some traps yesterday and I've never trapped here before, so I can't wait to check them. Okay, so here's our first trap. Now notice these are set in fairly shallow water. 
because I don't want them to be so deep that stuff would drown, air breathers. And there are a couple other things I have. I've got this stake that goes through a hole in the side of the trap that secures it. Then I've also got this cool float. This is one of my new designs. The idea here is if it does roll into deeper water, this will show us where the trap is if that happens. So anyway, let's check, check one and see what we have. And the first one has, right off the bat, not, not much in here, some newts, a crayfish, and a mud turtle. And I love mud turtles. They're fabulous little guys, real common in wetlands like this. A couple things I can tell, it's a male. It's got a scooped out bottom. You know what? I'm totally wrong. This is not a mud turtle. This is a stink pot turtle. So I stand corrected. I had to look underneath the plastron. So this is a stink pot, Sternothrus odoratus. But they do, if you first glance at them, they do look a little bit like mud turtles. Musk turtle is another common name, M-U-S-K. And that's because they kind of smell. Anyway, that's pretty neat, stink pot. There's something in here. There's a mud turtle and looks like maybe a siren. It's hard to tell. Oh, there's all kinds of stuff. Oh, that's bait. Yeah, there's a siren, a greater siren. So what a neat animal. Now these are really hard to hold on to. Let's look at this one first. Beautiful fish. This is one called a blue spotted sunfish. Boy, that is gorgeous. You can see those, those spots right there. So it's a member of the sunfish family, but blue spotted sunfish. Boy, they're neat. I'm gonna dip it in the water again. Look at this beautiful water and look at all the tannins in it. Looks like iced tea, doesn't it? And that's from decaying leaves and stuff like that. So. A lot of tannins in the water. Okay, let's see how this is gonna work. These are pretty athletic, so just maybe kind of pour it in. There it goes. Look at that. Now, one of the things you notice about these, they have front legs, but no back legs. So this has a flattened tail, almost like a fish, like an eel or something. And look, external gills, greater siren. And this is a medium-sized guy. They get quite big. Wow, what an animal. This is one of those animals that, unless you, you know, we're in the right place at the right time, you're just never going to see it. They're very common, but just very hard to come across, basically. Now, they can do some kind of cool things. In wetlands like this, they can breathe with gills, but they also are pretty good at gulping air, too. Okay, so we're going to let this one go. These don't bite. Some of the other species do, but the sirens don't seem to be biters. They're pretty... Pretty athletic though, but really hard to pick up. There we go, that's one way to release it. Guys, if you look, man, there's some magnificent trees here. And notice how they're kind of buttressed at the base. These are gum trees, Tupelo trees. And that's one real characteristic of wetland trees is they're often, you know, kind of like a cypress is. They're very broad at the base. All right, here's another trap to check. Two stink pot turtles. Boy, three stink pot turtles. Boy, this is uh, a lot of, a lot of turtles for sure. So these are all gonna, gonna pull all these guys out, but it's kind of fun to have this many. There's one. And these two, these will bite you. They have long necks. And of course, they're not being mean. Look at this little guy. Look at that cutie. That's an unusual size. So, you know what? There's four stink pot turtles in this trap. There's got to be some sort of rule about how many you can hang on to at one time. So look at that. One, two, three, four.
Oh my gosh, look at that. So that's not the siren. Boy, look at that Amphiuma. So this is kind of a medium sized one, but again, not the, not the siren. This is, this is really a different animal. And these bite, so I'm gonna be a little bit more careful with this one. But this one has front and rear legs. And again, this one, you can see the, you can see the rear legs. Very tiny rear legs with little tiny toes on them. This is one called a two-toed Amphiuma because each one of these legs has two little toes. But, you know, like the siren, an animal that, in, I mean, a lot of people don't even know these exist. And again, they're very, very common. This, <laughs> they're very slimy and kind of hard to hold on to. And of course, there's the possibility that they might bite, which makes it a little, you gotta be careful with them for sure. So I think I'm gonna put this one in the plastic container so we can have a look at it. This seems like too small a container for this animal. Wow, <laughs> what, what an incredible beast. Look at this tail sticking out. It looks almost like an octopus tentacle or something like that. Of course, that's the tail. And these guys, see if I, <laughs> I'm afraid this is gonna go terribly badly. But, oh man, what an animal. And this is an adult for sure. Although I've seen bigger ones, this certainly is a good size adult. But again, a salamander. I mean, it looks like an eel or something, but it is a true salamander. In fact, it's, it's, it's a member of Amphiumidae, the family, and it's, whoa, this is gonna be interesting. And you can see, the, I'm gonna stand away from the jaws. Let's see if we can try that again. Look at the slime, guys. So they're just covered with slime, which makes them hard to hang on to. So <laughs> I love that look with the tail. Anyway. Uh, Two-toed Amphiuma, and a big aquatic salamander that lives in these wetlands. And again, it's a real treat to see one. Very exotic looking. <laughs> okay, I'm about done <laughs> with this one. Again, you want to be really careful handling these because the bite is, is really, really bad. So I'm going to quit while I'm ahead. Oh, what a neat animal. Well, that's that. Well, you got to watch. <laughs> Sorry about that, guys, but it slipped right out of my hands, and uh, I was really kind of too chicken <laughs> grab him and try and put him back in. But two-toed Amphiuma, and an animal that, man, I never get tired of seeing. We're standing on 10,000 acres of incredible habitat right in the middle of the Ace Basin, and we get to get out in the field with Dr. Andrew Bridges, and he's the executive director of the Nemours Wildlife Foundation, and he's gonna show us around today. Andrew, thanks for letting us tag along. Oh, I'm so happy to have you, Tony. So before we start touring the property, tell us a little bit about how this place kind of came to be, how it got started. So Nemours was uh, established in 1995 by Eugene DuPont III. Um, his family, they, they left a 10,000 acre piece of property with the idea that it would be used for research and education and demonstration. And uh, we've been uh, so fortunate to be the stewards of this amazing piece of property ever since. So Andrew, you, I've been out here a few times before and you've got an incredible diversity of habitats here, don't you? It truly is a remarkable place. We have about 6,700 acres of upland habitat. We have longleaf pine that we're restoring. We have pine savannas. We have mixed hardwood forests. I think we're more known though for our, our wetlands. We have about 1,900 acres of managed tile impoundments, which would have been the historic rice fields. Yeah, but you can't really appreciate the diversity of habitat we have here unless you go see some of it. Yeah, absolutely. So Andrew, you guys use a lot of rice drunks on the property, don't you? Absolutely. This is really one of the most important management tools that we used here as a Moors. I'll see the water flowing out there, Tony. So what these allow us to do is to manage the water levels inside the impoundments, which are we see over on the other side, um, down to an incredibly fine degree, you know, sub, sub one inch levels of, of water management. And that allows us to create some really remarkable wildlife habitat and, and so, resources. And that's one of the ways you can draw in the birds. You can create really good quality habitat for 
some of these birds that might like the water, you know, only this deep, right? Absolutely. We can manage the water to produce food for the birds as well, which is one of the things they really focus on is, uh, is creating that invertebrate food for the birds. And, it, and they blend in beautifully, but I can already see that there's a ton of birds. So it looks like a nice group of avocets over here. Oh, goodness, Tony. That is one of my favorite birds that we have here at Nemours. I don't think there's a more elegant bird in the world. Yeah, and that contrast between black and white really makes them stand out, especially when you look at them through binoculars. Absolutely, the curved bill, and they march in formation across the mud flats together, looking for invertebrates and worms. Yeah, it uh, looks like they're moving that beak, that curved beak, just back and forth in the mud, probably fishing out little worms absolutely. or whatever invertebrate they can find. That's right, probing in the, in the pluff mud. So Tony, you see the great blue herons? There's a couple of them over there. Oh yeah, boy, yeah. that's like, they, they remind me of dinosaurs. They, they, <laughs> they exactly, they totally look like dinosaurs. And, and this mud flat is really one of, the, one of the really rich feeding grounds we have here in the Ace Basin for all sorts of different shorebirds and wading birds. So on this side, you know, we have, this is all, all natural, natural marsh and mud flat. So this is all drained out because the tide's gone out. But just on the other side of us, on the other side of the dike, uh, we have a fishery. So the fish that are, we have been managing for in this impoundment are now flowing out through this through this dike and, and through the water and the, the herons are enjoying them. Yeah, <laughs> but they are catching them <laughs> they come out the other side. Absolutely. Man, this is beautiful. Isn't it, Tony? So this is a, uh, a pine savanna that uh, we've worked very hard to restore. And uh, that open understory is really important, Tony, for red cockaded woodpeckers. Yeah, I noticed the trees. So you've yes. got some trees that are painted, Absolutely. and also you have some artificial cavities here, we right? We do. So, we, so we, we have artificial nest cavities that were installed uh, as a place for the woodpeckers to nest. So, you know, these woodpeckers historically would have nested in longleaf pine. We're basically replicating those live trees. In this case, these are loblollies that we have here. Yeah, but they're big loblollies. Big loblollies, yeah. They have to be 60, 60 plus years old. These are some big old loblollies. And I know one of the things you and I both like is when you manage for red cockaded woodpeckers, you manage for lots of other things. Absolutely. A lot of cool birds, uh, but what I'm getting at is yeah. reptiles and amphibians as well. Things like corn snakes and, and rattlesnakes. In fact, you guys actually do some research here with diamondback rattlesnakes, We right? do, and in fact, there's probably a, an eastern diamondback somewhere within a couple hundred yards of us right now. We, uh, we work with Paris Island. We actually traded fox squirrels from Nemours for uh, eastern diamondbacks from Paris Island. An excellent trade as far and, as I'm and concerned. Agreed, agreed, agreed. Research is one of the really the cornerstones of what we do here. And, uh, we have a very close relationship with Clemson University. We've had uh, numerous graduate students over the years from Clemson that have come out and worked here. We have a, a, a wide variety of different universities that we've worked with. It's really exciting. It's one of the best parts of the job is getting to work with all these young scientists and helping them with their research projects. Yeah, I agree. So this really is a beautiful spot. Absolutely. This is, this is a unique, one of the unique habitats we have here. But if you got a few more minutes, Tony, there's one more place I would really love to show you. Okay, absolutely. We need to be a little stealthy here, don't we? So Andrew, there's, yeah, it looks, they're kind of, wow. I'm trying to be as small as I can. I but if you there look are, right here, there's a bunch. Oh what goodness. do we see there? Spoonbills and snowy looks like egrets. there's a snowy egret. This pond to the right often has a lot of alligators on it. Let's see if they're, if they're in there. <laughs> wow, there are lots of alligators. Egrets, and I've noticed yeah. these, look at this tail drag. So that's obviously where the tip of the tail has gone across and you can see it went right down. So there's an awful lot of alligators that are going from here to there and there to here. You know, those birds have a lot of pink on them. Wow. So Andrew, how many species of birds have we seen? I don't know, I almost lost count. So coots, spoonbills, wood storks, snow egrets, great egrets. We saw a harrier. Saw a harrier, that's right, great blue heron. How many ducks? I, I have no idea, I'm not great Model with ducks. Model ducks, blueing teal, gadwall, pintails. 
I mean, it's just incredible. And the other thing is just the, the sheer numbers of all these things, big flocks of this stuff. Absolutely, absolutely. We, we manage these impoundments for, uh, for invertebrates and for, for food for all sorts of different birds. And that's, you really see it when you, when you ride around out here. And here we are at the Cumbie, right? Absolutely. So on the other side, we've got the Cumbie River. This is one of the three rivers that makes up the Ace Basin, the Ashapoo, Cumbie, and Edisto. And uh, the Ace Basin is truly one of the most unique landscapes in the, in the world. And one of the things that I appreciate, I mean, we're obviously collaborating with you guys on an environmental education program. And I know both you and I got our start through environmental education. So absolutely. you guys have big plans to do more of that? Oh, absolutely. It, it's just so important. I mean, it, really being able to spark a love of nature in the, in the next generation is something that is really meaningful. And it's a big part of our mission here at Nemours. Well, I'll tell you what, I, I appreciate that all you're doing at Nemours, but also I appreciate you spending the day with us today. It's been, it's been an absolute blast, Tony. It has really been a treat. Thank you. So we visited some beautiful habitats today and seen some remarkable animals. But remember, this is just a small fraction of what's here. It would probably take somebody a lifetime to explore the entire ACE. So I guess you better get out there and get started. Thanks for joining us on Coastal King. Funding for Coastal Kingdom is provided by the ETV Endowment of South Carolina, which proudly supports this program. Through the generosity of our members and donors, the ETV Endowment has funded educational and entertaining programming like Coastal Kingdom for more than 40 years.